Yeah, we're back with the live. Jay Fidel and uh, Think Tech over here. And we're talking about Coronaville, what's next? We're talking about the coronavirus uh, with Stephanie Dalton uh, and Winston Welsh, as we do every Thursday uh, at 11. Here we are. And Hello. so let's talk about what's going on this week. Um, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about his Rose Garden appearances first. So Winston, is it, is it helping? Um, is it helping in dealing with the virus? And is it helping politically now that he's back doing press conferences and you know, political press conferences about the virus? I don't know. I mean, he, he did wear a mask and he said it's now patriotic instead of being anti-Trump to wear a mask. But I'm not sure that it's sunk down to his supporters yet. Um, I was talking with a, a colleague of mine who lives in, uh, whose uh, brother lives in Georgia. And she said that wearing a mask there, that, um, he, he wore a mask inside to, to a, a liquor store, I think she said. And the woman at the counter, nobody was wearing a mask. And uh, she, and the lady said, oh, honey, I, I and she said, like, you had cancer. Oh, I, I hope you, you get better soon. Um, and, and he's like, no, it's there's a pandemic going on. We're all supposed to be wearing masks. But uh, for that, I'd say whatever Donald Trump is doing now, um, it's not about the public it would be only because he thinks it's going to help his re-election chances that that because he's losing so badly in the public perception as to how he's handling this and people were saying okay you got to wear a mask and maybe now he jumps out and he has his speeches again so we'll go from there but no i don't think there'll be any effect either way okay i think, yeah. it's, I think it's clear that he he uh, diminished the importance and threat of uh, uh, vi the coronavirus from the outset. And he made all these r ridiculous statements about how it was of no, no consequence. And even recently, it's just a sniffle, you know, um, and it's gonna disappear and all that. Right. Uh, and the question now is he's changing his tune. It's, it's that alternative facts moving while you watch. And now, now he's saying it's serious. Um, so the question, Stephanie, is, is that gonna stick? Is he gonna be able to convince people between now and the election uh, that he's legit? that he's really fighting the good fight against coronavirus? Well, I mean, this tool of the daily briefing is not going to do it for him and because he got the feedback all wrong. I mean, the people were unhappy <laughs> not about the program and the daily briefing. The feedback was, get off the stage, Mr. President. He wasn't doing anything useful. They want the medical uh, people. Was it useful now? Uh, yes, I think so. We need to have um, we need to have those charts up for people to understand what the strategies can be to understand how important, for instance, uh, doing something as a nation simultaneously rather than waiting for each state to get to a certain place and then start but being able to look at the data to see what a difference it makes if you know if new york outbreaks again in a week or someplace does you know everybody should go down because it just it gets everybody on the same timeline and it gets you, you guys see the article in the new york times uh where there was a, a an affirmative uh, strategy developed in the white house uh to lay it on the states in order to avoid accountability responsibility for him you see that article it's very interesting, right? Uh, and 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 I think that's that strategy still exists, doesn't it? He's trying. He's still trying to lay it on the states. He's tr trying to get out of the way on being responsible for this. Yes, um, it's a masterful attempt to uh, do decoy and de de you know de de deploy stuff to you know in other ways that don't come back on him. But the fact of the matter is is it is because everybody understands that without a national policy, it's not going to work. And the evidence has continued to accumulate that people do actually do what he says. And if he doesn't say wear a mask, they won't wear a mask. If he says drink the Kool-Aid, they'll drink the Kool-Aid. Well, so that, that takes me to the lag effect, you know? If Donald Trump changes his view on, on day one, uh, yesterday, whatever, this week, um, how long does it take for that to sink in? How long does it take for that to sink into the woman in the shop in Georgia where she begins to understand, you know, we have a pandemic? Um, or, or does she remain ignorant for the next X months, uh, maybe, maybe through the election? And she never really understands. She's getting all her signals from, from him. Um, and and it, it never catches up with her. I think there's a lag in terms of public opinion, public information. What do you well, think I you, well, what I think attribute that, that if I could go ahead and chat. I um, it's Fox News because if that person is only watching 
is watching one single station and uh, not attending to any other input from, from media, then they're not going to get the information they need to make the best decisions about their own and their family's health. I mean, that is another uh, accountability that that news station ought to take on. They are not keeping the data up. I've talked to people from Phoenix, Arizona here who didn't know that Phoenix, Arizona was a flame and had, had to share ICU beds. So, I mean, this is, this is the problem of looking at one source. So people are, are really- Okay, well, it, would you say, Winston, that it's a combination of things? What are the factors that make people so ignorant? Well, there's a, there's a, a willful ignorance uh, inside of so much of the country and denial. Um, I, I, I see this Stephen, uh, even, um, uh, Stephen Miller's grandmother died of COVID and, and the son blamed uh, Donald Trump these are people that are following it that says, hmm, maybe there is a connection between people getting sick and people dying. Now, I, I also read that the CDC said based on its, uh, its testing that 10 times more people actually have gotten this, this virus than is being reported, which makes sense. You know, we're not testing most people and most people- We've heard that before. We heard that from Redfield a couple of weeks ago. And that's what, that's what we're seeing. So, we're, so it may be that we're, there's a lot more cases than of course, than, than we thought, but that the people that are getting sick, that, that it's, they're really getting sick, and we don't know what the long-term effects are of those. It's easier not to look at it. It's easier to put your head in the sand. And also, when you have been told for months and months and months that this is not a problem, it's going to go away miraculously, it's, uh, it's, it's Chinese, so you're not even going to get it if you get it, and, uh, and, and maybe we're going to sacrifice a few people. But the... Uh, you know, when you're looking at this and you have a leader that says, don't wear this, if you wear the, a mask, you're going against me. I think all of that adds up to a, um, an atmosphere where people do not want to, uh, to change their mind. Or if they do, the repeated exposure where they said, oh, well, now Donald Trump is saying we should wear a mask. So how many times do you have to watch, like Stephanie says, Fox News? Uh, to get that message. And maybe all of the Fox News people will start wearing a mask for one week if they're sitting on the stage together and say, hey, just to get the message out here, here it is. But oh, I think I think it's very well taken. And in fact, it leads to our a question we just got. Um, and when I say qu well taken, I mean that it's not only the mask issue. It's this momentum thing that if you if you say and he does, if you drill down on a lie over and over and over again, it's very hard to get people to get off that because yeah. they are blindly loyal to him. And that loyalty drives them to believe him about something he said before, even when he changes his position. And there's some kind of twisted thinking in there that says, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not accepting what he says now. Um, I accept what he says before. Now, here's the question. Uh, Trump also said he was the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln. Do his supporters actually believe that? He's the greatest president of all time of the history of the universe. I'm not, not even just since Abraham Lincoln. So, you know, uh, don't even qualify it with saying 150 years ago. This He's obviously the best president and the smartest and the brightest. And he's passed his cognitive test with flying colors. Look, okay. Jay, we can't go by really anything that's coming out of the White House we have to, th there are signs of, uh, that it's coming around it. It's Redfield, it's Fauci, it's even Deborah Burks now, although she's sort of on board with the messaging again. I think they're all trying in their own ways, but he's a leader of a movement of a willful ignorance. You know, you have a Governor Kemp in, in, in Georgia um, where he is suing Atlanta because Atlanta has a mask um, requirement. Now, the mayor of Atlanta is sick with COVID right now. But he's suing the city and saying, no, you're violating people's rights by making them wear a mask. This yeah. is insanity. It uh, is. It is insanity. It's insanity. And so it's not just that, Donald Trump. The reason I'm asking the question is I, I want to know what is the mechanics behind people who seem to be insane, the people who reject the truth and the obvious evidence again and again and again. And, and I think what, what he has achieved, uh, and I like your view of this, Stephanie, what he has achieved is complete confusion. Um, and in a pandemic, confusion has to be about the worst thing you can, you can have. 
Um, but can we talk about that? You know, because can you lead? Can you lead a nation um, in trying to survive a pandemic by confusing them? Um, yes, obviously, because he's done it to us. So that means you're asking, well, we need to think about why we're eligible for that. Why are we susceptible? And I have to submit that I believe we've got a chance to redo the education system for the reasons of the pandemic, but we need to do something about making sure we teach history, we teach civics, and we get critical thinking to levels um, that, that people must aspire to in order to be, be the democracy, the great democracy we claim to be. Otherwise, we're going to go right down the tube. Um, and as I've read recently, you know, the, none of the democracies have lasted. I mean, Greece's went down, Rome's went down, they've all gone down. And so we're the ones that have the cross to bear now, if you want to consider it that, if we, we have the, the privilege of carrying the cross of democracy forward. And if we really want to do that as a nation, if that's important to us, well, we've got to educate our citizenry. And not to be ideological, but to be knowledgeable and know how to think about things. And we're just not doing a good job. Well, I, I think a lot of people around, including here in Hawaii, don't, don't even see this issue. Um, they're not aware of it. They're, they're interested in other issues. But the fact is that COVID is the most significant story of our time, of our lives, maybe of the last few hundred years. I mean, since the, you know, the Black Plague of uh, the 16th century, which killed half of Europe. Um, and it's, it's going to keep on going until we find a way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, you know, what is the worst case analysis on this disease? And we, you know, we get all this confusion about what to do. Uh, people are really confused or ignorant or a combination of willfully ignorant and willfully confused. Um, we get no leadership of consequence. We get the states all in trouble. And then we get all these distractions like the Portland uh, brown shirt experience on top of all of that, which will get worse. Um, and meanwhile, the, the virus is relentless. What's mm -hmm. going to happen here? I, I hate to ask you a, a question that calls for something other than optimism, Winston. But what... <laughs> It's, <laughs> go, Winston. <laughs> what, what's going to happen? Go, go, go. <laughs> it's, well, you know, the, the, yeah. <laughs> it's a cheap way. You threw me off there, Jay. I, uh, I do remain optimistic. You know, we're we're in tough times right now. Um, I, I saw a funny uh, uh, posting that says um, uh, America closed for repairs. Uh, we'll reopen under new management um, in January, and I think there's something to be said for that. That we've just become so fractured and weirded out. Um, that if you're not sick of what's happened just from any angle in the last four years, you really haven't been paying attention. But we have a chance here to step back, to look when this is done. And I think, you know, there is remarkable progress being made medically for, for I mean, uh, all types of vaccines that are being tested. We'll come out of this on another end, but then you're going to have your anti-vaxxers. So what is that all going to mean? I don't know. But in the end, when we do the big debrief, as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there's gotta be sort of a Corona Truth and Reconciliation Commission where we look at our systems, our structures, our response ability and responsibilities and, and we'll step back and we will come back so that when the real, when the real plague comes, this is just like a kindergarten version. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just sad to say that's my unoptimistic voice. Yeah, hey, you know, but you're making, uh, you know, Stephanie, he's making a lot of assumptions. For example, he's assuming that our democracy will remain viable. And, um, you know, the fact is that the COVID, we've had other shows on this question, but COVID requires a global response. It requires a non-isolationist response in any event. It, it requires a collaboration among scientists all over the world, which we are actually standing in the way of. Um, you know, closing down our relationship with China, not a good idea closing down our relationship with the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. We're not, we're not doing the kind of collaboration we have to do. It's, it's this that's what's going to happen here, and which may not be a perfect solution because you can have a vaccine and you can have a vaccine. They don't all work the same. They're not all as effective as they, you know, the other ones. So I guess my question is, um, 
uh, Stephanie, I, you know, are, are you optimistic on this kind of thing? Do you think that the framework of the country, the democratic framework, which is right now failing us, and we'll see in November how, how, much, how, much, how much failure we're really dealing with, um, don't you need that democratic framework in order to solve this problem? And if you don't have that, because you have a, you know, a, a, an emerging tyrant going on here and a, and a government that, that, that is a, miles away from what the founders contemplated without a rule of law, um, can you solve without, and with isolationist policies, can you solve COVID? Or is it going to be um, you know, a struggle for hundreds of years? Well, I think that um, it's been unwise for uh, the U.S. to operate as it is. Of course, because we're shorting ourselves on the benefits of our our um, medical um, expertise. We, you know, we're not. It's not engaged because we we're not getting the synthesis of it, which is not just within the United States, but our collaboration, as you say, with all of the others. That's what we need to combat this virus. Is we've it, it's a bad one. It's a challenging one. It's a beast. So we need everybody. It's just like we need the whole world to get, you know, that meteorite <laughs> not to come our way. I mean, we need everybody. And now we've got the meteorite. Right, right here, and uh, we've decided. Well, no, uh, we're going to get all, uh, you know, tied up in all this other stuff. And I'm really concerned about what we still have to go through because as these these um, immunizations develop, it looks like we're on a fast track for something um, that's been publicized lately. And uh, I'm very worried about that because it's going to raise up right away, as Witten said, said the anti-vaxxers, and then we're going to have side effects and it, unanticipated perhaps. And it's a short, it, it's a rush job and the fights over who's going to take it. So we, and so that's in addition to even if Trump loses the election officially and, uh, and has still has five more months to do damage. We still have so much to go through. It's like we still have the hardest part of this trial to pass through to get to the end. So the question is, will the democratic framework hold? I mean, right now it's pretty wobbly, but will it hold? And will those um, Republicans who are conservative, but without authoritarianness trends in there, they're not like the revolutionaries for an authoritarian situation, really, when they get down to it, maybe they'll be able to step out, especially if he loses the election. But we're in terrible jeopardy. I think the worst part of it is yet to come. So hang on, Sloopy. Yeah, and that's not even talking about Douglas which is on the way to Hawaii well, exactly. as, a, as a class three hurricane storm. Nobody cares about us out over here. Over the weekend, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, after this show, go out and buy food and water, okay? Um, so Winston, uh, I, wanna, I wanna drill down with you. I know you've been reading about the research in the vaccine, the research in the therapeutics. How are we doing really? Because uh, you know, there's a certain amount of confusion about that. You hear it from this guy and then from another guy and you see an article about this, that, and the other thing. <clears throat> it's hard to get your hands around <clears throat> what is really happening, who is doing it and how likely it is to succeed. I think that's an exact summation of where we're at in that. I read all types of things. Oh, this one's in testing. This one's, in oh, this one's, we just got this government funding. The Germans invested in the one that was going to be stolen, um, you know, earlier by uh, America. It, it, you know, we're forgetting though. Yes, our our democrat uh, democratic uh, framework here is wobbly right now, but we're resilient people, and we will come back. We just have had so many people that um, are. I don't know how we actually share common news, and one plus one does actually equal one, and we've got to get back to. What else equals, does two plus one equal three? And that's where we've got to go back as a nation and figure out those truths that are just true, whether you like them or not, that, that viruses are spread from droplets. It's not some conspiracy theory. So where, are you, vesting your, where are you vesting your, your, your confidence? Is it in Fauci? Because he's been sidelined. Uh, you uh, know, I think it's Joe my, Biden. It's not clear what's going to happen in the election. I am. I, I'm, I'm investing just because of uh, I, I wanted to be so because the alternative is so dire. We also have to remember, even though we may have pulled back from uh, from 
WHO or from, uh, you know, actually we can't leave the nation now. We can't go to Canada or Mexico. We can't go we're anywhere. Uh, we have giant pharmaceutical companies that are multinationals and they don't care who the president is. They care about the almighty dollar, euro, uh, yuan. They will develop uh, treatments and cures because it's in their best interest to do so. And it doesn't matter where their corporate headquarters are. The medicines will ultimately just be distributed everywhere. So uh, just based on the enlightened self-interest of these corporate entities, we will have these treatments. We will have these cures. They will come to us. They will be administered in different ways in different places. And the marketplace of sickness and ideas uh, will bear fruit. Uh, you see, when you open up cities and you say there's no requirement to wear masks, you have certain level of infections and when you have others that say we're wearing masks and we're we're going to vaccinate our population you're going to have different results so out of all of that and this sort of sad competition uh but the best and brightest will result out of that so i'm basing it in optimism of okay well, uh, the, they don't the want emerging, the, i don't like the opposite emerging truth is we have an economy that is totally falling apart while we speak um, you know, there's, there's whole sectors of the economy are closed, going bankrupt. Um, you know, United and, Airlines, and United I, Airlines. I just have is, to say that. Virus that... straits. And so my question to you, Stephanie, is, um, A, do you agree that we have to solve COVID before we can really reopen? And in any event, you know, what is the way we can reopen an, an economy that is in free fall? that every day while these uh, briefings are made and all these alternative facts are presented to us and all this confusion in Georgia and so many other places about what we have at hand, um, you know, how, how, how are we going to restore an economy that is being destroyed in front of us? Well, I, I believe that we haven't done all the things we could do as a nation, okay? We haven't done things simultaneously. We're not all wearing masks, blah, blah, the whole list. So could we try that first? If we do all of the things we know and we do them systematically everywhere, all together, it's a national objective, it's a plan, it's a policy. Let's try that. That would get us back in the game and maybe get us to open the economy more if we do the things we know to do. But do not think for a minute that if those pharmaceuticals, as you guys are saying, are gonna put out all of this and are gonna be making all this the big bucks, you think our leader is not gonna do something about that? Who's gonna be in charge of where all of that benefit goes? Who's going to then use the act from the 50s to be able to direct things as the government wants them? That's when he's going to use it, is to be able to have a contingent thing to use. We're even in more jeopardy then as to who is going to get it and who's going to control and decide who gets it. This is why I'm saying we have ahead of us a lot more challenge then we've got behind us, if you can believe it, it's already so hard. But, but to answer your question, Jay, is that we need to do what we know to do and we need to do it willingly and voluntarily. We shouldn't even need to have legislation or policy or you, there should just be a call from our president who's as great as Abraham Lincoln. Well, that's, that's normative and very nice, but that's not happening and is not it's likely not. to happen. That's the reality why. is that I, I told you. Uh, I told you about um, you know the, the people in the street in New York. We have some questions. Yes. Um, Trump says to wear masks, but then he turns around and threatens threatens schools to reopen. He's forcing them to reopen or trying. Uh, why do you think Trump is pushing so hard to open the schools? You're the educator among us, Stephanie. What's your answer to that? Well, he wants the parents to go back to work. And he thinks that the kids don't get it because he's not reading the studies. He thinks that the youngsters don't really get the virus or have no effects from it. But mostly he wants the, the structures back in place, the babysitting system of the schools to allow people to get back with the economic work. Right, but so the, his plan does not include uh, solving the problem. Okay, let's go to uh, another question. Everyone questions Oh, there's two questions. It's almost half the population of the United States believes that Trump is the greatest president we have ever known. 
how can this threat to democracy ever be resolved? And I suppose inherent in that, Winston, is how can COVID be dealt with if half the country believes whatever Trump tells them? Because then that means half of us are confused, like the woman in Georgia or the people in Queens who went out and had street parties without masks last night. And de Blasio was pulling his hair out because you remember New York had a bad time. Um, so how can we how can we come together in a country um, that believes Trump? Half of half of the country believes Trump. I was reading something somewhere. It's about a third of the nation says Corona death rates have been underreported. Uh, this is sort of conspiracy theory uh, that they've been underreported. Another third said they've been overreported. And then I guess the other third didn't really have an opinion. But this is quite interesting that it, it, that was broken into thirds instead of halves. But it's probably the, the question is right. Half of the nation believes in one way. Where do we find the truth with our fellow countrymen? that one plus one equals two and one plus two equals three. I think after Donald Trump is out, and Stephanie is right, our, our darker days are ahead. We're gonna have a hell of a, of a summer and fall here. And it will pre, it will it will follow also, uh, hopefully when, when Joe Biden is in, but he will institute a national policy of directing resources that is appropriate by a leader of a civilized nation in confronting a major health threat, threat like this. And getting people on board and educated and saying, look, folks, yeah, we're, we're not trying to infringe on your rights here. We're trying to save your life. And these are the facts. Um, these are real facts. They're not alternative facts. Um, and, but we're not there. And we're not going to be there. Um, even if Donald Trump changes his tune and says now it's patriotic to wear a mask, um, that would be like him saying now that voting by mail is, is safe and effective and um, and good if he found out that that was going to be better for his outcome. When you got a train going down the tracks pretty fast or a big boat, you can't just put on the brakes and, and turn to starboard like that and expect the whole thing to move. It's a long process. And so um, we have to just rely as best as we can, as I've been saying for a couple months, on our local officials, on uh, federal officials that are doing the best job they can under the circumstances. Um, on uh, and just your common sense, you've got to take your own individual responsibility here. So, you know, and and then and pray, and pray for the best. Pray. Th there best it is. Leaders. That's the takeaway from this uh, show. <clears throat> so, Stephanie, we've been into this for six months, and the results have been dire, both in public understanding and in the in, in the uh, infection of the pub of the public. Um, and as you said, it's. We had five months, even if Biden wins the election, we got five months more of Trump thereabouts, um, where that could be just like the six months we've just had. This thing could spread far and wide, much further, much wider, because it's right now, I think everyone agrees, it's out of control. Um, so what can we do uh, you know, to, to track on Winston's thought? What can we do individually? Um, and in terms of, you know, the, our local government, what can we do in those five months to avoid a, 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 a civilizational ap apocalypse? Yeah. I mean, we're about to blow up further, according to Burks and the kinds of um, secret conversations we've heard there are that there are more states ready to, to blast off. Plus, New York's going to come back if they were that silly to, to go out and do that. I think that um, all along here, we... Trump could have had a, a better opportunity to show his, his, his greatness if the Senate had acted its role, if the Senate had done what its due diligence was. They have done nothing to, to help the House, even when it wasn't Democratic. Well, is the Senate <laughs> leaving him? Is it, there are certain indications that the Senate is... Uh not so enamored with him anymore, Rand yeah, Paul well, stepping think, up as a Republican. And uh, I think we ought to send uh, letters like crazy to tell our senators, everybody across the nation, get on with it and do just do your job because we're out of options for impeaching him again or whatever, if only we could do something like that. 
um, if things are going to get so bad, maybe Andrew Cuomo needs to be run into the White House temporarily to run the show for the nation. I mean, his performance was so outstanding that, that and then we're still stuck with Dumbo here on on the virus uh, actions. But anyway, the point is, would the, we just need to write our get our representatives to do what they're supposed to no, do? No, that's a, that's an optimistic point that maybe maybe the Republican Party will stop uh, supporting him because they'll realize. Um, that November will be Judgment Day on him and on the Republican Party. But the other factor, and this is my last question, Winston, I'd appreciate it if you'd try to tackle this. Um, let's see if I got, yeah. Um, you know, we have violence going on in the streets. Um, it, it started off innocently enough with um, their First Amendment protest and then some people, provocateurs made it violent. And then Trump stepped in. He's going to save us all by, by using these uh, brown shirts. It, it all looks so much like 1933. Um, and he's now threatening to go into various cities. And the people in the protests are reacting to that, including completely you know, nonviolent protests. The mayor of Portland uh, was in the protest group demonstrating where you know, her head is at. Um, so my question to you is, uh, how are we going to cope with the virus when we have the violence? I don't see an easy solution on the violence. And Trump, you know, to satisfy his perception of what his base wants from him is going to go city after city, and the cities are going to respond. And before you know it, the whole country is going to be burning, not only in virus, but in violence. Mm -hmm. um, how, does this, how does this play? It's my last question. It's not, not an easy question. Much more, for me, much more worrisome. Uh, the virus we can deal with, we can understand. You wear a mask, you stay home, you wash your hands, uh, you limit contact. We understand that part. But the threat to our democracy and when you have a stated goal of going into Democrat-controlled cities to, uh, to quench violence, um, you know, spray painting a building, Nobody, normal people don't want it. They're not participating in this violence. But when you're faced with a threat, then of people coming in and, and, and trying to, uh, you know, stop on your I'm not spray painting a building's not your First Amendment right, but protesting um, uh, legally or or demonstrating legally, that's your right as an American citizen. The last time I checked, and when that is threatened, then you then you stir up a whole bunch of emotions. You kick the hornet's nest when it doesn't need to be kicked, when things are just calming down, actually, and people are starting to step back and say, oh, what was that whole thing about last month and how are we gonna go from here? This is actually a um, something that I think would play to his his base and, uh, and he might get some traction out of it, but I do not expect the Senate Republicans to step up. The, the followers of of uh, the, the Republic, former Republican Party or in name of Republican Party, they support Donald Trump. They do not support their individual Republican um, senators or colleagues. He is the leader of the party. That is who they support. We're gonna have to figure out what it is that people actually support in Donald Trump's message and how do we take that and understand that to be integrated into our society. What inside of there is a legitimate concern and it's, it's, we have it's very to hard to solve a medical yeah. problem without medicine. You know, it's like uh, I'm yes. watching this lecture series about the, the Black Plague. If you want to see it, you can see it on Amazon. It's a woman's name is Dorsey uh, Armstrong, and she yeah. lectures about the Black Plague. And, and, and one of the things that made it so difficult and lethal was they had no medicine. But if you don't believe in the medicine you have, if you diminish, you know, the effect of medicine, you don't use medicine, you lie about medicine, it's it's taking us back to the 14th century, isn't We're, it? That's where we are. That's where we are. We're in the 14th century. He's done that to us. Thank you, Dr. Trump. So, okay, 30 seconds. Um, Stephanie, what's your what's your expectation for this coming week? Uh, I think uh, they just canceled the Jacksonville uh, Republican convention site. So that that's a, a positive thing, I suppose. But that might be the only positive thing that's lying ahead. And I think it's just going to get rougher and rougher. And he's going to, um, and then if, it, just as I've already said. So I would love to see um, our Republicans uh, get, get their, get their, 
groove on or whatever and get on with their job and that everybody write letters to their senators and reps that you know that's the government that's got to do the work here and he's ir he's irredeemable i'm sorry winston read mary trump's book it explains it all you Thank know you, what I, I, i'm gonna keep i'm gonna keep out the hope I, I want our leaders to rise up to the occasion maybe donald trump will have a come to jesus moment and realize whoa, I've got to do something here because that's what I've got to do. And I am holding out hope beyond hope for that, um, that he, he just starts singing a different tune. I, it's probably not realistic, but- Okay, I let's, let's go, out. let's all go out on the lanai and smoke some of that stuff that uh, <laughs> Winston's been smoking. Thank you, thank you very much, you guys. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks. Aloha, we'll see you next week. Aloha, mahalo.